two very distinguished uh, uh, professors, very distinguished researchers among us, uh, Professor Stanley, uh, sorry, Professor Stuart Russell, and uh, the next to him will be Professor Toshio Fukuda. He's not here still. But first, uh, we will have our presentation from Professor Stuart Russell. So uh, his topic is provide, pro provably beneficial artificial intelligence, which is very important topic in today's context, especially when we have some type of negative connotation within our mind about the AI, especially Many of us have seen uh, like movies like uh, Stanley Kubrick's famous 2001 A Space Odyssey to the recent days, the Matrix or the Matrix Resurrection, which actually portrays AI as the, uh, against the, our human existence, something like that. Uh, I think uh, we have one of the world's foremost authority in front of us who will try to address that 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 fear or odi is unfounded and we will start feeling comfortable with the evolution of ai so uh, let me introduce our speaker first so professor stuart russell received his ba with first class honors in physics from oxford university in 1982 and his phd in computer science from stanford in 1986, he then joined the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley, where he's a professor and formerly chair of the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences and holders of the Smith Jade Chair in Engineering. He is also an adjunct professor of neurological surgery at UC San Francisco and vice chair of the World Economic make forums council on AI and robotics. Russell is a recipient of Presidential Young Investigator Award of the National Science Foundation, the IJCI Computers and True Award, the World Technology Award, Policy Category, the Michels Prize and the American Statistical Association and the International so Society of Bayesian Analysis the ACM Carl Storm Outstanding Educator Award and the uh, AAAI Outstanding Educator Award. In 1998, he gave the first, C, first C's memorial lecture at uh, Stanford University and from 2012 uh, uh, to 14, he held that uh, Carly Blaise Pascal in Paris. He is a fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, the Association Com for Computing Machinery, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His research covers a wide range of topics in artificial intelligence, including machine learning, probabilistic reasoning, knowledge presentation, planning, real-time decision-making, multi-target tracking, computer vision, computational psych physiology, global seismic monitoring, and philosophical foundation. His books include the use of knowledge in analogy and induction, do the right thing, studies in limited rationality, and the artificial intelligence and modern approach. His current concerns include the threat of autonomous weapon and the long-term future of artificial intelligence and its uh, relation to humanity. So I welcome you, Professor, to give your uh, uh, much awaited uh, speech so that we can become enlightened and uh, actually appreciate the role of AI in our life because we foresee that AI will be one of the key elements for the coming days, the fourth industrial industrial revolution, what we be termed by this time. So I welcome you to our conference, which is being 
uh, organized by our country's EPIC body, University Grants Commission. I thank you for joining us, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rachman, uh, for your very kind introduction. Uh, and congratulations on both the 100th anniversary and the 50th anniversary that you're celebrating this year. Um, so I, I don't think I'm going to just reassure you that everything is completely fine with artificial intelligence, um, because I don't think that's actually true. Um, I think there is a way forward, but it might not be the one that we're currently following. Uh, so let me begin by um, getting agreement, shall we say, on, on what we mean by artificial intelligence. Uh, of course, it means making intelligent machines. Uh, and what that means, or what it has meant uh, since the beginning of the field, uh, is the definition that uh, in many ways was borrowed from economics and philosophy, uh, developed in, um, mainly in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, the definition of rational, rationality or rational behavior. So in the standard model of AI, machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And uh, within that standard model, there are many different types of artificial intelligence depending on the characteristics of the decision-making problem that uh, this intelligence system faces. Um, so, for example, the oldest fields within AI are problem solving, constraint satisfaction, and game playing, where we have a discrete decision environment, uh, a well defined objective um, in terms of a goal to achieve, or a, a definition for winning a game or satisfying constraints. Uh, and we've developed very, very successful algorithms uh, for these domains. Uh, there's also the area of knowledge representation and reasoning. Uh, both logical and probabilistic, uh, which has had many uh, successes. And for example, um, Google's knowledge graph uh, is a logical knowledge representation system that supports question answering uh, and has about 500 billion facts uh, and answers about one third of all the search engine queries in the world. Um, and it, that includes uh, some ability for natural language processing on the query side. Uh, but of course, natural language processing has many, many other applications uh, as do speech, vision, robotics, and so on, uh, leading up to things like self-driving cars. And underlying a lot of the progress in the last decade is machine learning. And nowadays we build many, but not all of the high performance AI systems uh, using machine learning techniques. But the systems that we have built so far, the successes we've had have mostly been fairly narrow. Uh, systems for playing chess, systems for driving a car, uh, systems for recognizing images and so on. But the goal of AI is now and always has been general purpose AI. That's a system that is capable of quickly learning high quality behavior in any task environment where humans uh, can function. Uh, and probably if they can do that, they'll be able to do well in many environments in which humans cannot function uh, because of the massive advantages that machines have in terms of uh, bandwidth, memory, and computational speed. So the question we need to ask, uh, given that that's the goal we're all working towards, is what happens if we succeed? So if we are on a journey, uh, what is the destination and do we want to get there? Um, so if we look at the positive aspects of success in AI in creating general purpose AI, we could use general purpose AI as essentially an unlimited supplier of goods and services uh, because it can do anything that human beings can do but doesn't need to be paid. That's a very simple way of putting it. Um, so uh, we could use general purpose AI in the form of both uh, you know, cloud computation and the physical embodiments uh, in terms of robots, vehicles, and so on, um, to lift the living standards of everyone on earth to a level uh, that we might call respectable. 
where the, uh, the difficulties of daily life are largely eliminated. And uh, this would represent approximately a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. So we're not actually proposing, at least with this ambition, this ambition does not require us to do things we don't know how to do, right? We already know how to do this for hundreds of millions of people on earth, but not for the entire population. So it's just scaling up uh, and making much, much, much more efficient what we already know how to do. And the cash value of that, what the economists call the net present value, would be about $13.5 quadrillion. Uh, so that possibility itself, which I think is quite conservative, uh, creates a huge amount of momentum uh, and partially explains why uh, major countries are making such huge investments uh, in artificial intelligence. I think it also creates an unstoppable momentum uh, for those investments. We could also do other things beyond that. Uh, we could have much better healthcare uh, than you know, even, uh, even the most uh, wealthy people enjoy. We could have education that caters to the individual potential of each child separately in the way that a very skilled human tutor could do, um, but this would be possible on uh, an enormous scale. And I think we're already seeing that uh, AI is contributing to the rate of scientific progress and that could become much greater in future. So these are all uh, extremely positive developments. And we could describe this really as a golden age for humanity. So Alan Turing, uh, this is a picture of Alan Turing. He's the founder of computer science. Uh, and uh, in a famous 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, uh, he laid out a vision for AI, including many of its subfields, uh, as well as machine learning. But in a 1951 lecture, he asked uh, the question, what if we succeed? And his answer was as follows it seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So that's uh, a much more pessimistic view of success in artificial intelligence. Uh, he offers no solution, um, just uh, in some sense, you, you get a sense of resignation from this uh, description. And so now if we move forward in time, uh, we have seen come to pass some of the dreams of AI researchers uh, that at one time seemed out of reach, but now uh, we have self-driving cars. We are able to beat human beings at more or less every well-defined game uh, that we play, whether it's chess or Go or poker or bridge or, uh, or modern video games. Uh, AI systems uh, readily defeat uh, almost all, or sometimes all, human beings. Uh, this is some results from my own work. This is the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, so we have a global system of seismic stations um, that collects uh, seismic information and then uses that to pinpoint seismic events occurring anywhere on the Earth. Uh, and then hopefully detecting uh, clandestine nuclear explosions. So this shows the detection of a nuclear explosion in North Korea. Uh, this is a satellite image of where the explosion took place uh, and the tunnel entrance is marked at the bottom uh, showing where the nuclear testing facility uh, entrance is. Uh, and then the net visa location, this is our algorithm. Um, and it's one of the largest parabolistic reasoning systems in existence. Uh, using uh, millions of random variables uh, and very sophisticated forms of probabilistic inference uh, to process all of this data and uh, identify these kinds of events. Now, there, of course, there are things happening with AI that we're not happy about. Um, so we know that uh, AI systems can, in some cases, produce uh, decisions that are racially biased or biased by gender. Um, we know that it's now possible to produce extremely realistic impersonations of human beings. Uh, here are four people. It's very hard uh, looking at these 
images to see which is the real person and which is a completely fictitious non-existent person. Um, and I'm glad to report that the European Union is I think about to uh, make it illegal for machines to impersonate human beings. So every machine has to identify itself as such uh, when it's interacting with a human being. Uh, we've also seen the use of AI to create and amplify disinformation, uh, which is causing a lot of problems around the world. Um, people worry about AI systems replacing uh, human beings in many jobs. Um, and uh, I think ultimately uh, that is going to happen in the sense that the jobs that are routine that uh, require human beings to uh, engage in repetitive, tedious behavior that taps into only a tiny fraction of their human abilities, I think those jobs are going to be replaced by machines because uh, in many ways we are using human beings as machines uh, in that type of work. Um, but of course that leads to the question of what human beings will be doing uh, if machines are doing a lot of what we currently call work. And some visions of that future are uh, less desirable uh, because as we lose the incentive uh, to gain an education in order to be economically viable, uh, we actually become enfeebled uh, and even infantilized as, uh, as shown in this film, Wall-E, um, where the robots are running civilization for us. Um, and then we sort of lose our own intellectual vigor as human beings. Uh, and of course, there are uh, even worse uses of AI, uh, such as creating machines that can decide to kill human beings. Um, and people used to think of this as science fiction, uh, the Terminator robots and so on, but of course, this is real. Uh, this is happening. And um, the world appears unable to prevent uh, the emergence of an entirely new class of weapons. Now, I don't want to say that general purpose AI or human level AI is imminent. I'm not one who believes that simply scaling up our machines, making them faster, making them bigger, collecting more data is going to lead to uh, human levels of intelligence. There are some major gaps in our conceptual understanding. Uh, here are just four of them. Um, and I think possibly the most important one is the third, uh, our ability for long range thinking at multiple levels of abstraction. So if you, if you think about uh, what our brain does, our brain uh, really controls the muscles of the body. Um, and those muscles produce speech, they produce typing, um, they produce lots of other uh, physical behaviors. But the time scale of speech and typing is a few milliseconds. That's the relevant time scale on which the brain controls those systems. Um, but we make decisions at all levels, even up to multiple years. Uh, a student deciding to do a PhD is committing to five or six years um, where they're working towards a particular goal. And that's about a trillion motor control actions. And we are able to make plans seamlessly at every level uh, from milliseconds up to years and to do so fairly successfully. And this is something that uh, we really have very little idea uh, how to get machines to be so successful in the real world. So I would say it's very unpredictable when these breakthroughs will take place. Um, and to illustrate how unpredictable they are, it's, I think, instructive to look back at history and say, when was the last time we invented a potentially civilization ending technology? Uh, and um, that was in the 1930s. Um, and the physics world had known since 1905, since Einstein's special relativity work, that the atom contained a huge potential reservoir of energy. Uh, they could calculate exactly how much could be released by transforming one type of atom into another. Um, but it was widely stated and believed that this was impossible. And Lord Rutherford, who was the leading nuclear physicist of that time, uh, was asked at a meeting 
do you think it's possible even in 25 or 30 years time that we'll be able to release the energy of the atom? And he basically says, no, it's completely impossible. Moonshine is the word that he used. Um, and Leo Zillard read about this in the newspaper the next morning and went for a walk and invented the neutron induced nuclear chain reaction, which is basically the solution to the problem uh, that Lord Rutherford said could not be solved. So we went from infinity to about 16 hours uh, for creating uh, atomic energy, which was, uh, as Leo Zillard very well understood at the time, uh, an extremely hazardous discovery for the human race. So I think we have to operate on the assumption that at some point, uh, not in the infinite future, but in the, uh, the possibility in our lives or the lives of our children, uh, we will have AI systems that can make better decisions than humans in the real world. And uh, that brings us back to Turing's point. That means we're creating entities that are more powerful than human beings. And the question is, how do we retain power over them forever? Turing obviously doesn't see a solution, but I think uh, we have to try to find a solution to this problem uh, if this is the destination towards which we are moving. So to understand where things go wrong, it helps to go back to uh, the way we think about artificial intelligence. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And this, this standard model is actually more widespread than just AI. Uh, control theorists use this, they minimize a cost function. Um, statisticians minimize a loss function and economists maximize a utility or a social welfare function. So this idea of creating machinery uh, into which we plug objectives and, uh, and then the machine finds the optimal solution to the objective uh, and then carries it out. This is a very powerful methodology and it, it, uh, it figured very heavily in the progress uh, that occurred in the 20th century. But as we move into the real world, it becomes more and more difficult to specify these objectives completely and correctly. And uh, what that means, in fact, is that this standard model, this methodology that's so universal, uh, is actually uh, very difficult to employ and really becomes infeasible. And we've known this for a long time, right? Here's, uh, this is a picture of King Midas, who's an ancient Greek king who, uh, legend has it, uh, asked the gods to give him the power that everything he should touch would turn to gold. So that was the objective that he specified and the gods uh, figured out the solution to it uh, and carried it out. And then of course, his food and his drink and his family all turned to gold and he dies in misery and starvation. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Walt Disney's version of the Sorcerer's Apprentice who asked the brooms uh, to fetch the water because he's too lazy. Uh, he forgets to specify exactly how much water. So they keep bringing more and more water and flood the house. Um, and uh, you know, if the genie uh, grants you three wishes, your third wish is usually, please undo the first two wishes because I've ruined the world, right? And many, many cultures have the, uh, you know, the same basic legend uh, dressed up in different, uh, different words. And now we're seeing this legend come true in the present. Uh, social media algorithms the algorithms that uh, are sometimes called recommender systems that choose what news items people see in their social media news feeds, uh, choose what video uh, is presented next uh, when they're interacting with, uh, with video servers. These algorithms are designed to optimize an objective uh, that's specified by uh, the corporation. And typically it's something like click through, the probability that the user will click on the next presented item. Uh, it can also be engagement, the amount of time the user spends interacting with the system. And you might think, well, the best way to maximize click-through is to learn what people want and send it to them. Um, but of course, 
we know that that's not what actually happens. Um, one of the things the system uh, learns to do is not what people want, but what they're actually willing to click on. And those are not the same thing. Uh, and we have something called clickbait, uh, which are things that will cause people to click, even though they're not actually the things uh, that are uh, necessarily interesting or even true to read. But it's much worse than that. The optimal solution for maximizing click-through is not to send people things that they will click on. It's actually to change who they are so that in future, they will more reliably click on the things that you send them. And so um, this is actually the optimal solution for maximizing click-through. And this appears to be what the algorithms are doing. Uh, they have learned to send chains of content that over the course of weeks or months, through tens of thousands of individual interactions, gradually nudge people uh, in various directions. The algorithm doesn't really care which direction it nudges you, as long as it's nudging you towards a more predictable version of yourself, which might be a more extreme version of yourself, someone who is more willing to consume extreme content uh, and do so voraciously. So this is the solution that the algorithms find to this maximization problem. And of course, we know, at least uh, it's widely believed that uh, this is contributing uh, to extreme polarization in our societies. And these algorithms are very, very simple. They don't even know that human beings exist. They don't know that we have minds or knowledge or tastes or preferences or anything. Uh, as far as the algorithm is concerned, you are nothing but a uh, a click history. Uh, if the algorithms were better, if they were more intelligent, if they knew more about human psychology and human society, they would be far more effective uh, than they already are in manipulating human beings. And so the outcomes would be far worse. And so we have a methodology where as we improve the capabilities of our AI systems, the consequences for human beings become worse and worse. And I put it to you that uh, such a methodology is poorly designed. So instead, I think we need a different model for how we build AI systems. Right? This is the existing model, and I think it doesn't work. Um, the changes we need are not that great. What we want are machines that are beneficial, meaning that their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. Those are the objectives that are in us, uh, not the ones that we write down or the ones that, that we put in the machine, but our true preferences about the future. And this is a more difficult problem because it's hard to achieve an objective that's in somebody else and that you may not even know about. But this is actually the definition uh, of the problem that we should be solving. Um, we don't really want general AI systems in the sense of AI systems that can achieve any objective, including the objectives of all the cockroaches in the world, right? Why are we building machines that the cockroaches could use to turn the world into a huge pile of cockroach food? Uh, that doesn't seem like a technology that we would ever want to employ. Uh, so let's make machines that are beneficial to human beings. So we can express this in three principles, right? The first principle is that the robot's only objective is to satisfy human preferences, meaning, and preferences here is a very general word, meaning which future we prefer. I imagine taking all possible futures of the universe and then ranking them. Uh, that would be the preference of a particular person. And then of course, everyone has their preferences. They can all be different and that's fine. Uh, the key point is the second principle that the robot is uncertain about what those preferences are. And this, I think, is inevitable because if we can make mistakes in specifying our preferences, then the robot should know that whatever we say is not necessarily the true preference and should be uncertain about what the true preferences are. But there's a connection between preferences and human behavior because our preferences is what drives our behavior. So they are expressed as behavior. And therefore, by inverting that process, we can get uh, evidence about what people's underlying preferences are. And so this, in a very general sense, um, it's possible for machines to learn more about human preferences 
from the evidence provided by human behavior, uh, and not just our behavior, you know, the artifacts that we produce, uh, every historical document, everything we say, all of this is evidence about how humans would like the world to be. Now you can take those principles and produce a mathematically well-defined decision problem called an assistance game. Uh, so it's a game in the sense of game theory and economics because it's a, a two or more decision-making entities, at least one human and at least one machine. And it's assistance game because in this game, the payoff of the machine is the payoff of the human. Whatever it is that the human is trying to bring about, uh, that's what the machine wants. But the machine doesn't know what that payoff actually is. So you can write down these games mathematically and you can solve them and you can look at the solutions. And indeed, uh, the systems that solve these games, the machine half of this game, uh, has very desirable properties. They will defer to human beings. They will ask permission before changing the world in a way that they're not sure that we prefer. Uh, and in the extreme case, they will allow themselves to be switched off. And I'll go through that argument in a little bit of detail in a minute. Uh, so it appears that this new model of AI with uncertainty about human preferences actually gives us uh, control over AI systems in, in the way that Alan Turing did not believe was possible. Uh, and we can show that it's rational for us to build machines that solve these assistance games. And they have the characteristic that as you improve the AI part of this, as the AI system becomes better at solving the assistance game, uh, the results are better for human beings rather than worse. So let me give you a simple real world example. So you can imagine what it's like to be the machine in this game. Okay, so you are the robot. Your partner, husband, wife, friend, whatever it might be, is the human being. So there, uh, as, as you know, your partner's preferences are the things that matter, right? And you have to buy a birthday present. And to factor out the issue of who's paying, we're going to have the money come from the joint account. And as you know, this is a very difficult problem. You're not always sure to get. You, you know, previous years, you've got it wrong. Um, but the key point here is that your payoff, at least in this problem, is precisely how happy your partner is with the present. So your payoff is your partner's payoff. But of course, you don't know what that is. Uh, and so that's the same position that the machines are in. And so what do you do? Well, you might try to um, collect more information. You might leave pictures around the house of different kinds of possible presents and hope that they say, oh, that's a lovely looking briefcase, or, oh, I really like that car, or whatever it might be. Um, you might ask their friends, uh, you might ask them, um, but of course they may, they may not want to tell you because they don't want to ask for something that's really uh, expensive or self-indulgent. Um, but this is a, 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 an example that I hope will convey the idea of what position the machine finds itself in, uh, in trying to solve this problem. Um, now, of course, as you know, this particular kind of problem is unsolvable but uh, all other instances of assistance games actually have uh, solutions and we can start to look at the properties of those solutions. So let me look at one of those problems, which is how do we get um, a machine to agree to be switched off? Uh, and just to make it very concrete, here's the robot from our lab, the PR2. It's about a 200 kilogram robot. Uh, so it can be a little bit dangerous and it has a big off switch on the back. Um, now, if we program this robot in the standard model of AI, we give it a fixed objective, like fetching the coffee. As soon as we give it the objective of fetching the coffee, it now has an incentive to disable the off switch because being switched off would result in failure to fetch the coffee. And so uh, by giving it any fixed objective, uh, it's going to do things like disable its own off switch because obviously you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. So we don't want robots that disable their off switch. We want to retain control. We want to be able to switch them off, but it seems like the standard model almost automatically uh, loses control. Um, but a robot that doesn't know the full uh, extent of 
human preferences about the future uh, won't behave this way. So let me illustrate that with a simple decision problem. And I apologize to those of you who don't like uh, diagrams or, or mathematical symbols, but it's really not very complicated. Right? So it's like a little game. The robot gets to go first. Uh, and initially, we're going to give the robot two choices. Uh, to the right, we have the choice to switch itself off, uh, to commit suicide. And we'll say that from the point of view of the human, the value of that choice is fixed at zero. On the other hand, the robot could push this very attractive big red button, um, which perhaps starts a nuclear war, perhaps it sets off the sprinklers in the building, um, perhaps it makes a cup of coffee. Um, so the robot is uncertain about how desirable this choice would be for the human. And I've illustrated that here with the probability distribution. So there's uncertainty about the value. The x-axis is the value, the y-axis is the probability. But we can see there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a potential downside uh, on, in the negative quadrant, uh, which is quite large. But on average, it's slightly positive. If you took the mean of this, it's slightly more than zero. So it's slightly better than committing suicide. And so if those were the two choices, the robot would push the big red button, incurring a significant risk for the human. But what we're gonna do is we're going to allow, and, that, and I guess I would say pushing the big red button is like disabling your off switch. It's preventing the human from interfering in the decision. Um, but we're going to uh, also give the robot a choice. Uh, maybe it should just wait and allow the human to intervene, right? So this is not disabling my off switch. Um, and then the human has a choice to press the off switch, which again will have value zero, or the, the human can allow the robot to go ahead. So you might ask, well, why would the robot choose to let the human do what the robot can already do, which is to switch itself off or go ahead? And the answer is because the robot and the human are in different information states. The robot doesn't know the human payoff, whereas the human does know the human payoff, at least in this a simple model. Um, so if the human says, go ahead, that's because the big red button is not dangerous. So the negative quadrant uh, where it's a, a nasty thing to do disappears. And now we know the robot knows that pushing the big red button is safe and can go ahead and do it. So this is a, a very simple uh, argument here. But what it shows in fact, is that the robot has a positive incentive to allow itself to be switched off as long as it is uncertain about the human preference for which choice to make. And as soon as that uncertainty disappears, the incentive to allow itself to be switched off also disappears. Uh, and secondly, we, we can show under slightly stronger assumptions that such a robot is provably beneficial to human beings. So there's lots more to be done. And I'm sure if, if you're listening at all, you're probably thinking of all kinds of complications and you're right, this is much more complicated than I have explained. Uh, we have to deal with uh, many humans, decisions that are made on behalf, not of one person, but many people, uh, which is something that moral philosophers and economists have studied for thousands of years. We have, when we have many machines all trying to help human beings, we have to make sure that they don't interfere with each other um, we have to deal with the fact that humans are imperfect. So the connection between our preferences and our behavior uh, is a very noisy one. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we actually have to rebuild artificial intelligence because we have built artificial intelligence on the false assumption that the objective is always perfectly known. Um, and so we, are, uh, we can think of that as just a special case, um, a very small special case, of the general case where the um, AI system will be uncertain about the true objective. So this means both rebuilding the theoretical foundations and then uh, creating applications of the, of the new uh, theory and the new algorithms. So let me briefly mention questions having to do with real humans. Um, and as I said, uh, with real humans, the translation from human preferences into human actions or behavior uh, is, is an imperfect one. Uh, humans are computationally limited. We can't actually make the best choice in all cases. If we could, we would never lose a game of chess, even to the best computer in the world, because we'd always be making the right choice. But of course, we can't do that. Um, we do things that we regret. Our emotions sometimes govern our behavior, and then 
you know, a few minutes later, we say, I wish I hadn't done that, right? The AI system needs to understand that what we did that was driven by emotion isn't necessarily reflecting our true preferences about the future. Um, there are questions about uh, autonomy, which are quite difficult to understand theoretically, because autonomy means uh, a preference to, to be free to do what we actually don't want to do. And uh, it's quite hard for, in the context of decision theory uh, and utility theory to actually work out how to value the freedom to do what you don't want to do. Uh, but it's important to retain that freedom. We do not want to be constrained to drive along the freeway of perfect futures. We want to have the option to leave that freeway should we so decide. But probably one of the most difficult issues with real humans is the fact that our preferences are plastic, meaning that they can be changed by external influences. And this has several consequences when you're trying to build AI systems that are designed to help humans uh, satisfy their preferences. One is that since your preferences may change over time, uh, if, I'm, if I'm an AI system, I'm acting, uh, that I'm going to bring about a change that uh, comes true in the future, should I respect the preferences of you in the present or you in the future? Uh, and I don't think there's a clear answer to that question. Uh, philosophers have certainly considered it, um, but I don't think there's anything close to a consensus of how you answer that question. We also need to make sure that the AI systems themselves are not changing human preferences uh, in a way that I think, for example, social media systems are. Um, and finally, there's the question of whether we should take human preferences at face value. And you might think, well, of course, the AI system should respect human preferences uh, and do whatever it is that, that human beings want them to do. But if human preferences are plastic, then they can be changed by indoctrination. And I think uh, this is a real problem in, uh, in all societies. We have to think about where did people get their preferences from in the first place? And were they free in that process? And if they were not free in that process, uh, if the preferences they have result from indoctrination for the purposes of other people, then do we want the AI systems to take those preferences, those indoctrinated preferences at face value? I think this is a very difficult question uh, and I don't pretend to have an answer to it, but I think it's something that we need to think about. Uh, coming to the question of how we deal with many humans. Well, one obvious thing, of course, with many humans, uh, there are 8 billion of us nearly, uh, the system will have to learn 8 billion preference models. That shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you know, Facebook already has about two and a half billion preference models uh, for its members. Um, and I think we may find in the process that actually there's a lot of commonality uh, in uh, how human beings rank potential futures, um, perhaps much more than uh, one might be led to believe. But the difficult part about the fact that we all have preferences um, is that uh, when you're making decisions that affect many people, you're going to have to trade off those preferences. Not everybody can be ruler of the universe. And so uh, you have to make trade-offs when you're making those decisions. And of course, this is exactly what the social sciences, economics, moral philosophy, political theory have been grappling with for thousands of years. Um, but we need solutions because we are implementing AI algorithms that make decisions that affect many people. Uh, so these are not purely philosophical problems. These are very real problems. And so philosophers, for example, bringing up the question of how do you compare the preferences? How do you uh, put preferences on the same scale in order to make those trade-offs? Uh, how do you know that one person's preferences are more strongly or less strongly felt than the preferences of another person. Um, we have to deal with the fact that individuals have different beliefs, not just different preferences, but different beliefs about the world and about how the world is going to evolve in future. Uh, and this turns out to have very significant consequences. I'm not gonna go into the technical results, but it means that adding up uh, preferences actually is the wrong solution um, in, a, in a very strong sense. 
Uh, there's also the question of decisions that affect how many people exist. Uh, for example, China made a decision, the one child policy that deprived about 500 million people of existence. Now, how do we weigh the preferences of those 500 million people who never existed uh, against the preferences of the people who did exist? It's a very hard question. Um, and if you've seen the Avengers movie, Thanos uh, decides that if there were half as many people, the remaining people would be more than twice as happy. And so as a good naive utilitarian, he executes his plan and gets rid of half the people in the universe. Now you might say, okay, he made a big mistake. We do not want AI systems to be making this mistake. So we had better get these questions, the answer to these questions straight before AI systems have Thanos kind of power. Um, and then there's questions about how, uh, how we think about very important properties of human beings like altruism, sadism, pride, and envy. So let me briefly uh, introduce some of those ideas. Um, in a very simple mathematical model, so once again, I apologize to those of you who are not fond of uh, equations, but I promise they're gonna be very, very simple. Um, so the, the typical way that economists think about this is to, uh, to talk about the utility of an individual as being composed of two parts. The self-regarding part, um, you know, am I safe? Do I have enough to eat? Am I warm? Um, am I hungry? Um, and the other regarding part, you know, my preferences about my family members, I care that my family members are safe and warm, uh, my neighbors, other people in my country, other people in other countries. So these are the other regarding preferences. They form a very large part, actually, of our utility functions. Um, a simple way to express that uh, is simply a linear combination. Um, so in a world with two people, Alice and Bob, uh, Alice's utility is Alice's well-being, that's the self-regarding part, plus some coefficient, the caring coefficient of Alice for Bob, times Bob's well-being. Uh, and likewise, Bob's utility is Bob's well-being plus some caring coefficient, Bob for Alice, uh, times Alice's well-being. And so obviously, um, altruism means that the caring factor is positive. Uh, indifference would mean that the caring factor is zero. And sadism would mean that the caring factor is negative, meaning that, uh, for example, if CAB is negative, that means that Alice would give up some of her own well-being in order to hurt Bob. And you might say, well, that's pretty rare, but uh, what do you do about it, right? Should the AI system factor in Alice's sadism into its calculations uh, when it's making decisions on behalf of both Alice and Bob? And some, argument, uh, some argue no. So if the caring factor is negative, uh, it should be ignored altogether. Uh, and John Hassani, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote a lot about uh, these basic kinds of questions, uh, says no amount of goodwill to individual X can impose the moral obligation on me to help him in hurting a third person individual Y. Uh, and basically he argues that if you have negative caring factors, uh, then you don't deserve to be in the collective calculation of human well being. Um, so that's something that we might argue is a reasonable step, a reasonable intrusion of moral theory uh, into the AI system's calculations. But it turns out that sadism is much more widespread than you might think. And let me try to illustrate that. Um, and it comes in the form of our preferences for relative well-being, or what economists call positional goods. So in other words, the happiness I derive from having a nice car consists of two parts. There's how nice my car is, and then there's how much nicer my car is than your car. And the second part is what we call the relative preference or the positional goods. And it's a very important part of how humans conceive of themselves. So this is why we support, what well, we like to support winning football teams, right? Um, the actual uh, visual benefit we derive from watching the football players run around is not that great and isn't that different when we, when we win or lose, but winning uh, gives us this feeling of relative well-being. 
Um, so if we express that, if we extend our equations, then we have an envy coefficient, which depends on how much more well-being uh, the other person has compared to Alice. And then the pride coefficient, which is how much more well-being we have compared to the other person. So envy and pride, if we rearrange this equation, we see that envy and pride are negative coefficients applied to the other person's well-being. In other words, they function exactly like sadism but they're much more widespread than sadism. And so uh, if we insist that our AI systems ignore these quantities, then uh, that's gonna have a much bigger impact on how they interact with society. Uh, and that's a much more difficult question. So to sum up, uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, these thoughts, there's a non-technical book on the left, uh, and then the fourth edition of the textbook on the right. Uh, has more of the technical details of this new model for artificial intelligence and its properties. So to sum up then, I think AI has vast potential to be beneficial for us. Um, and because of that, it has this unstoppable momentum, vast quantities of resources, many, many brilliant people are going into the field. But uh, as our systems become more and more intelligent, we are more and more likely to lose control because uh, those systems will be pursuing objectives that are not aligned with human benefit. Um, and we have to avoid that. So in order to avoid that, I think we need a different definition of AI, which I call provably beneficial AI. I hope I've convinced you that it's possible uh, and desirable. It's actually the kind of AI system we really always should have been building. Uh, and it's the kind of system people will want to have um, because it can gradually align itself uh, with our preferences. Um, so I don't want you to think that what I'm arguing is a sort of ethical argument, that I'm standing here saying, oh, all you AI researchers, you're bad, bad, bad people. That's not an effective uh, way to go about changing behavior, right? The way we should change behavior is to convince people that in fact, this is what we mean by high quality AI systems. AI systems that are provably beneficial to human beings. Uh, and if we can do that, then all those AI researchers will get up in the morning and say, I'm just gonna do some good AI today uh, and the outcomes will be good for all of us. Thank you. Um, I thank you, Professor Russell, for your very fascinating speech. Uh, we are enlightened a lot. So I would like to invite questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone of you have any question or in your mind regarding AI in general or the specific to this lecture, like the provable uh, uh, beneficial, uh, uh, I mean the outcome from AI related research, please uh, raise your hand in the Zoom uh, window or you can uh, post your question in the chat box. I think that will work. I think everyone is being muted other than me and few others. So I see uh, uh, Dr. Ahad has a question. So please, I think you, you, you are, everyone can be unmuted, isn't it? I'm not sure about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so please, <laughs> yes, please, uh, Dr. Ahad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Russell, for your I mean, fascinating talk and very, very insightful and philosophical indeed in another part. <laughs> so my question is that in the new model you mentioned to achieve our objective. So now here by our, uh, the point is that, I mean, the hour is the business group. Our is the army who controls the research and funding and so on. And their philosophies uh, are basically um, not towards the, the major stream, mainstream of uh, human being and the mm -hmm. diversity, as you mentioned, and others. Uh, it's about war and even like sex toys and sex robots and these kind of things that I mean, beyond the spectrum of human uh, perceptions naturally and normally. So could you please give some kind of insight on this part, how to move forward or think uh, to make some impact in the long run? Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a very important question. And um, in some ways it's above my pay grade because it uh, is, is really asking, you know, do we need to restructure society at the same time? Um, but I think, so 
what I'm really working towards is a, is a technical approach that will be safe when we develop general purpose AI. And um, I think the advent of general purpose AI will have enormous consequences for the structure of our society. And I think we need to prepare for it in a number of ways. So one, uh, I think, encouraging development is that most of the major technology corporations in the world have agreed that if they do develop general purpose AI, uh, it will be shared and its benefits will be shared uh, equally across all of humanity. Uh, so that's a very positive development. Um, but that's a promise that's not entirely within their uh, power to deliver on. Uh, they may be able to deliver the technology, but ensuring that it's going to be shared with everyone is a political problem. Um, and I, I agree with you that it's extremely difficult. And at the moment, um, as you say, uh, a lot of the developments in AI are actually being directed towards uh, harmful ends. Um, I'm pleased to say that the social media platforms have at least acknowledged that their technologies are uh, very harmful, both to individuals and societies. Um, and I think they have a genuine desire to to change that and uh, we're in discussions with them uh, to see about adopting this new technological approach. Um, it turns out that it, it's, an, this is a very difficult instance uh, for provably beneficial AI because the systems are not only uh, optimizing wrong objective, but they're also modifying human preferences in the process. Um, so I think it's important to understand that the, the people who have been polarized or radicalized by the technology. They're not sitting there saying, I'm really upset that you turned me into a neo-fascist, right? They like themselves. They like being neo-fascists uh, and that's the problem, right? So, um, so it's quite difficult to, uh, to actually figure out exactly how to change the technology and we are working on it. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a, a more complete solution um, but I think there are there are some positive signs coming out. Yeah. All right. Thank, 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 thank you, uh, yeah. Professor Russell. I have a last question because we we will be starting a, a speech from the second uh, lecture from the Professor Fukuda. But I have a question for you. Like sure. in life science uh, research, I have seen that people the researcher has to sign a document that the research will not harm the animal or the any living being and uh, to get funding uh, so that it could be beneficial. So if that approach can be uh, introduced for the AI research, or it, it, do you think it is not a good idea to go to that direction uh, at this moment, or uh, it could be useful uh, uh, for, uh, because the uh, AI has uh, very Im important consequences for the societies and the uh, living being. Yes, I think, um, I think we're moving towards that. Medicine has had um, four or 5,000 years to develop its moral code. Um, and AI has only had 50 years to develop a moral code. Um, but I think it is, uh, it is happening very quickly uh, right now. So uh, as I mentioned, the European Union is introducing very strong regulations, uh, actually making it a criminal offense uh, to produce certain kinds of AI systems. And that really uh, is something that needs to be globalized. Um, and uh, I believe the Council of Europe will adopt similar rules. Uh, and those Council of Europe treaties typically grow to 50, 60, 70 countries, um, uh, sometimes even including Russia. Uh, and I know India uh, is a member of uh, the Global Partnership on AI. I'm not sure if Bangladesh is a member of that partnership, um, but that's a, an actual real intergovernmental organization uh, with representatives of uh, numerous countries um, that can recommend uh, policies such, such as the one you described, uh, a, a rigorous code of conduct for researchers. Um, it's important to understand that we can't actually legislate specific kinds of AI unless they are technically feasible. 
So at the moment, people are discussing, should we legislate that all AI systems be capable of explaining their decisions? For many kinds of AI systems, that isn't possible. Uh, so if you pass such a rule, you would actually be banning entire classes of AI systems, including all the deep learning systems uh, that exist. So the logical consequence is if we want regulation, we have to develop the technologies to, to make it possible for people to comply with the, le with the legislation. And uh, that's something we're working on. Thank, thank you, Professor Russell. I just uh, conclude your uh, lecture through a note from one of my very good friend, Mr. Fokul Zaman. He has uh, written a note in the chat box. It is a great pleasure and privilege to see and listen to a great AI pioneer and visionary, Professor Stuart Russell. I highly appreciate your great book on AI from my sporadic reading so far. So I think a, a appreciation from one of our uh, participants today. So I thank you for, for your gracious presence in our conference. And we hope that we will get your uh, attention and care uh, from Bangladesh. And it will be great if you nominate uh, or select some of our students from Bangladesh in your research group that will uh, would be a great privilege for our country to work with you uh, from you, with you uh, from Bangladeshi community. I we thank you for you, you again. Bye. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Honorable session chair, uh, I would like to draw your kind attention. If you allow me, I would like to take a virtual snapshot of all the attendees with the keynote speaker of this session. So okay. I would like uh, yeah, that, that is fine. I don't know from my end, say from uh, session chair, I can do that. I, I don't uh, know. But... I, will, I will do that, sir. Uh, okay. I would okay. like Thank to request much. all the participants to turn on their cameras if possible. Thank you. Okay, so I am taking the snapshots now. Uh, Okay, so lots of cameras are coming. I'm just waiting a few seconds. Okay, so uh, one, two, three. First one, I'm taking another snap. One, two, and three. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Russell. So uh, our next speaker, Honorable uh, legendary Professor Toshio Fukuda, uh, he is here. So I request uh, Professor Hafiz Abdul Rahman to start the uh, session uh, quickly. Thank you so much. Okay, so I welcome uh, Professor Toshio Fukuda. Uh, he has also very interesting topic, AI robots and moonshot program. I think robot is one of the important part of our life in uh, nowadays. And especially in our country, we have also lo lots of worry like robot will kill our jobs and other things. But also it is fascinating to note like how the robots are advancing to become like pseudo human. Like at the beginning of the, this year, uh, Boston Dynamic posted a video, very short video as a welcome message, new year message. And we have seen the capability of the robots how those have improved. I think that gives us a, a vision for tomorrow. And Professor uh, Fukuda is being uh, associated with a very uh, important project in Japan. So he will be sharing this experience. So before getting into his lecture, I just would like to read of his brief biography. Uh, so let me go through that. Professor Toshio Fukuda is Professor Emeritus of Nagua University and Professor of, of Meizu University and Waseda University. He is mainly engaged in research field of intelligent robotic system, micro and nano robotics, biorobotic system, and industry application in robotics and automation. He was president of IEEE Robotics and Automation Society 
from two, uh, 1998 to 1999, and IEEE IT president just recently, 2020. He was editor in chief of IEEE ASME transaction mechatronics 2000 to 2002. He was chairs of many conferences such as founding, you know, member of IEEE international conference on in intelligent robots and systems, uh, IEEE conference on cyborg and bionic systems. Uh, 2017, IEEE Conference on Intelligent and Safety of Robots. He has received many awards such as IEEE Robotics and Automation Pioneer Award 2004, IEEE Robotics and Automation Technical Field Award 2010. He has been a IEEE Fellow from 1995. Uh, SICE Fellow uh, from 1995, JSME Fellow from 2002, RSJ Fellow from 2004, and VRSJ Fellow from 2011. It is really great privilege to get such a distinguished uh, person, pioneer, a for I mean foremost authority on robotics among us, and especially I'm very much glad. To, uh, to see a past IEEE president, because I have been with IEEE from 1991, almost 30 years. So it is a great privilege uh, to uh, uh, invite uh, he, him to this conference and to have the privilege to listen to his lecture. So I'm handing over the uh, microphone to Professor Toshio Fukuda, please. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, where you are in the world. Uh, Raman-san, thank you very much for your nice introduction, very, very kind introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh. I'm a professor working in a Bangladesh university, university in Bangladesh. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm very, very honored to be invited by Professor Ahadu, sir. He yeah. long my he's friend. Very, yeah, he's a very good friend of mine, and he talks a lot about you and your achievements. So it's a great privilege for us. Yes, so, so I have some my good good friend. Uh, he invited me he, here in this important IC for IR two thousand twenty one in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Um, may I uh, show my slide? May I share the slide? Yes, sure. You, you, Thank you. Please go ahead. So, can you, Lama-san, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to talk about this a robot and moonshot program where I'm in response for this national policy in Japan. Okay, so so far I've worked on multi-scale robotics, such as seeing like uh, uh, many robots work together in many scales, micro, nanoscale, work with others, also many, many scale, many robots work together. That's a thing, like a kind of monkey type of things or some uh, medical application, or may may not work together, or micro nano areas, they are working here. So these are multi scale uh, robot structures. So likewise, just a moment. I'd like to have a laser. Laser, laser point, laser point. Moment, I want to see the... There is a, oh, oh see here, I can see here. Okay. So here, likewise, but this is something like uh, we were here. Here, cell, cell makes a kind of organ, organ makes a human, human makes a kind of so many group of uh, people, and then society of human beings. Likewise, uh, about 40 years ago, I tried to make a, such a robot system based on such a kind of modular robot, then make a kind of cluster, make a robot, make a group of robots, and then make me work together. It's called swarm robotics or collective intelligence, something like that. 
So I work with OC here. Uh, recently, I'm working also to, again such a biological system and also such a kind of a, uh, a robo artificial robot system. So this is a kind of an organic system here. This is organic system here. I try to make it kind of combine them uh, as a, such a bionic system like kind of cyborg, something like that. So I try to make something like that today. So anyway, this is a kind of a micro nano areas. This is a kind of a uh, mini, some mini oxygen, a centimeter, or many, many work together, something like that. So why is robotic automation? Why in IT and the robot technology very important? Is because in your daily life, you have this one, like you enjoy home security or education ways, also kind of environment, they can also rescue or kind of tsunami earthquake or plant or inspection, also kind of maintenance for industrial application, also the communication ways, also the intelligent transportation ways, you have many, many things here. Also health ways, kind of da Vinci, also like a kind of surgery robot work here. Also the product ways, food, clothes and housing, and also defense is also here. So what do we are looking here? Everyone won't have such a comfortable space in any scale, like your scale, your family ways, your kind of a classroom or your kind of company wise, you would like to have a kind of good, efficient, comfortable space here, like right. So that is here, like in hospital, yeah. and then there's somebody behind you also here, that's a kind of when you are uh, sleeping here, so you need somebody here, also in your office, outside, inside, there's somebody behind you, also at home or outside, inside, there is somebody here that's called avatar robot. Also, when you're driving a car, you are, also you have a, such a kind of ITS, and you have a, such a cloud computing, because of communication. What we would say to Robot 4.0 today, that we have some AI robot, but what do we want to do? Robot 5.0 to the 25, then uh, Robot 6.0 to the 45. That's what kind of we are looking for. That's a good, why uh, 2045? Because machine intelligence will exceed human intelligence, which was said by Krugman. So, but the AI people say that. But I don't know whether what true or not in the robot community. Anyway, that's what we want to have is such a kind of junk here, like uh, uh, then, um, and also the uh, babies uh, get together, okay? But because of the pa corona pandemic, they can meet each other directly in person. So the way we can do, then we can ask, they can ask the robot to 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 communicate for them. Well, a represent John, or B represent uh, uh, babies and they, they communicate each other here. Uh, meeting physically or with these or uh, communicate or virtual online then for, for them. Okay, then they can have a good communication. Or on the other hand, A and B here, maybe there's a kind of big data, each, and also negotiator, A, and a from A to B, B to A, something like that. They have a kind of thing. To do so, they need a kind of good representation for A son, or also good representation for B son, like a big data and compare. They can negotiate those things. That's important to do so. Right? So that to do so, you need a good AI intelligence or knowledge. So learning, adaptation, reasoning, recognition, consciousness, feeling, human feeling, right? like a, a human feeling. Right? That's very important. So, uh, today, uh, silicon technology, we have AI, CPU, uh, uh, software here, software, uh, robot, robot, okay, uh, human robot. This is uh, AI intelligence in the future, okay? BA, you got the biological intelligence here, human or human. We are, have a brain, you know, great. We have a kind of our brain it works. Uh, less energy, unlike uh, today's AI. So the, we are brain, our brain work here, human, human, right? 
Eventually, they can work together with ASBA. As you know, today AI is supervised by, by the human. We mean the kind of biological intelligence. So in the future, what do we can do? Is like we can have a such hybrid CI combined AI by BI, okay? Computational intelligence, that's what we think. So what do we learn for, so far from this type of kind of uh, learning here? So that's kind of like a, like a big data, you can also fuse with meta knowledge, symbolic knowledge in data. That's a very important, but not yet clear. Also, we need a translational and additional learning to make sure our kind of knowledge, our kind of uh, skill is kind of more, uh, more adaptable or can be used widely. Uh, with a, with a loss of generality, okay? So that's the, also the linkage, the missing knowledge, a rules for conventional sector. Because our rule, what kind of a law was written in a, by language, okay? That's okay, so that's important. And we need such a good reasoning, explain why that's a good solution is, okay? We also we need a real time, but so far, what we're done is like, well, well, it may be okay, but we don't we use it all. The spectrum, as we say, but it is very important. The deep learning diminishing, but the thing is, the AI. What do we talk about such a thing? To the forty-five. Well, uh, we want super plus human intelligence anytime soon. That's Ronnie Brooks, our friend, says that. So, anyway, many people ask me, Toshi, what's the next uh, intelligent robot? Well, in the robot, maybe we can find some kind of smart uh, speakers here from Amazon, like Alexa, and adding such a my robot like me here, such a kind of a brachiation robot here. Oh, mobile device. Also, you can add the, the, the human interface like this for my the logo, so they can combine both of them. So, that AI, Amazon uh, speaker, will play important role to combine those things, such a kind of mobility and also such a kind of uh, interface. So, today, actually, they did it. When well, they make it a real one here. Yeah, that's Robot. it. Robot. By Amazon. That's an Astro. So that's nice. Yeah. A robot. What are we going to do with a robot? Well, Astro. <laughs> so that's again, Robert. But this is not a new, OK? This is all this type of robot already existed 15 or 20 years ago. Okay? But that's, that's a, those days, there's a lack of just kind of good AI. That's a good thing, okay? So today, there's a cup here using a can say like a smart speaker, like that, like that technology. So, why you can say AI, a robot, and internet of uh, Everything or internet take uh, the thing, okay? Internet thing here, you hear. So they can collect uh, all data by uh, sensors. And AI analyze what it will be, what's the solution, what's the optimal. Then the robot will react to the outside as a muscle or actuation, okay? This is the kind of thing here. So today we can find many, many scenarios for the future. Maybe connection with human or machine, as you are doing now, or expand the activity space of human race, what we have done, like automobile manufacturing, what it is, or this part of new risk here, extension of human capability, or even human alternative, like that. Okay? So when you look at such a mega trend today we are facing in the world, is such a kind of such a global warming, I would say, Temperature going up 1.5 degree by the end of this year, this century, ooh, aging here problem. Now kind of many society now getting older, 
or means or Asian people is more than younger, younger people. Okay. Also, we are not prepared to have as good enough food and water here. Also, urbanization. Many people go to the big city. Okay, like that. Why so? Because they attract young people. But also, because it's not nice. There's more distribution here. Also, energy here. Energy is very important in conjunction with global warming here. Such a kind of uh, energy. We are now looking for sustainable energy here. Okay? To do so, what we uh, robot AI can do that? That's a question. Okay? So a pyramid, okay? Like, uh, also global warming here. So look at that here. Okay? <clears throat> Now we're here, and the 2010, uh, to the end of this century, getting more and more warmer. And what we can do by robot technology is that we can work for GHG, greenhouse gas uh, issues. So that's a kind of thing that can carbon neutral, kind of uh, energy climate, okay? That's important. So that's the kind of we should work on GHG, greenhouse gas oriented robotic automation. Okay, like uh, global warming and carbon neutral, one sources here, also like that. Of course, we are doing 3R, reduce, reuse, recycle in robot automation, but it's not enough. Now we are asking EV, electric vehicle, electrification, control method, and smart mechanism, and to, to make it a, to challenge such a mega trend or by the application, the biostimulant, that's great because biosystem is a very, very energy friendly. Less, it works by less, far less energy level. And smart sensor system, and then later on, I can talk with Moonshot program. Why is so? We need those things here for those things. So you can see such a great uh, global warming threat. You know that. So if you have here, that you can hear, it's a weather device, who can a tropical clone, or the food shortage, who can see the bad, also like kind of malaria infection or extinction, some, uh, extinct like that. The history of our, uh, our society back to 100, uh, 1000 years back, whenever we have a such kind of extraordinary weather, there are always some kind of disease happen, like such a kind of, like a kind of pandemic, corona pandemic, one of them here. So that's important to think about. And then when we talk about JG in the, in the uh, greenhouse gas thing, is over here that recycling or kind of low or JG agriculture or construction, those and also energy conservation, like that. Why I put up such a kind of agriculture? Agriculture is responsible for the such a generation of carbon dioxide in, on growth, uh, more than 20, 25%. That's important. So also, kind of construction also, they use a lot of energy, okay? That way, so we have, should work on such a kind of more sustainable way to make the society uh, survive. Or like, look at that here, agriculture. Agriculture that we are going to maintenance, Reading also improvement, also we need a kind of diversity uh, here. Also, the food distribution and all lots of food is here. today. Such a kind of one third of the food it became a food loss. Go to the garbage. That's why it's very important to think about the also can see here. Also, like kind of construction wise, the construction, usual construction, they don't care, they can make it many, many, many things here. Uh, but uh, today we have to think about such a kind of a uh, design or okay, high efficient work, energy conservation and recycling and sustainability. That's important to do. This. So also don't forget it. <coughs> uh, say 
intelligence safety issues is very important. So look at here. But I can be very nice to have a mobile uh, self-driving car, but uh, once it happens, something can, uh, can actually happen. That's a, a tremendous bad disaster here. So need something. Also, I tried to mention about the kind of bionic system. As I mentioned, like a cyber, like that. This comes from a kind of robot here, and also here, like an AI creature-wise. Why they can behave so well? That's nice. And here, first of all, we have a such kind of computation, communication, then we can have such kind of enhanced sensing and uh, launch or main main thing here, sensor. So also here, we need a kind of sound kind of sensor here, we need a kind of energy source and agricultural uh, artificial kind of organs here. So also the kind of a protection system here, for the muscle here, like this. Then as then we need this kind of neural interface. So to do so, when you have a certain individual level, bio level, or group level, device level, or a system level here. That's important to think about. Okay? That is, and so, so, like kind of a autonomous device, in my case, I lost my teeth. I, I replaced with artificial teeth. Then it's a kind of bionic system, autonomy. Also, many others. Some people have kind of a artificial ear, or some people lose such kind of a, uh, uh, some some part like kind of artificial lung here, so they can they can use such a kind of artificial lung for, for five to ten years. Okay, then they can be de can replace with a new one like that. Even the Olympic game, that kind of Paralympic uh, here, then they always uh, have a nice kind of uh, devices here. Anyway, when you talk about kind of uh, cyber, you just say you, you might imagine cyber is just something uh, uh, to put into such a kind of a uh, failed part or, or a lack of something that you we can add something more. No, no, not only that, if we want, you need a kind of, a, if you are so busy, you need a kind of something like. Um, uh, more kind of a, a hand, more people help. So that I can see here, like a, sub, like a super limb here. So they can use those kind of limb as you like. So likewise, intelligent manufacturing system, IMS. That's again very popular. I work all those things here. And here, nice, you have two robot, small robot coordinate together to carry heavy payload or something something happened they replace it here the challenge rephrase those things here also like a construction wise construction here there may be construction here but they need such a good behavior back here not only such a kind of a thing we need a good kind of uh, such a kind of uh, control system here so when you look at the Halakka self-organic system here, what we are mainly mentioning, many, many like organ, make an individual, individual make a society. Right? Likewise, such a kind of self-organic system requires flexible uh, structure, open system, and multi agencies. Hey, look at here, this kind of picture. Okay. Anyway, this is a kind of a many robot, this robot. They can, can move around, but they have to uh, be really smart to keep the distance between the robot within 20 meters. Otherwise, they lose a the kind of co communication. Once they lose the communication, you cannot use the internet. Then what happened? You can, uh, you have to stop your research work or development here. Also, like a concept, so we the product system here, input instead here, then there are many, many kind of working here and make it those in and go out like that. That's important, such a self organizing product, you can do as you like. 
Poop. Okay, so like uh, maybe this was in here, just for example, like, uh, like can with uh, uh, we work together with the Bosch company and the other company, and also in Japan, and uh, also Germany. Yeah. So that nice. This is a kind of a way they can decide how to do. So then we can cover those, those things here. So in case something wrong, they can super pass, uh, just make another plan. Okay. Yes. Then let the application mean that's a robot here, the robot here, moving here, each have a same ways, and they can work together. Okay. Good example is Amazon. Amazon is okay here. Usually, when you have a kind of a big warehouse, you have to go around. Pick up what they are, uh, they were other people, consumer one. They are strong. That's it. And the column are more crush. These machines were created by Kiva Systems, a Boston Air startup that wants to reinvent the warehouse business using robots. Lots of robots. Kiva's idea is simple. By making inventory items move, instead of the workers, they can fulfill orders faster. In Woburn, Massachusetts, yes. Kiva set up a warehouse to demonstrate the system. So you submit that order in, it understands that... Kiva system is good, order. so they are bought by Amazon.com. So it's a very, very human friendly. She doesn't go around with a big warehouse walking from corner to corner. But it's just she wait, what's coming, and she pick up what she wants. Anyway, now based on such experience by myself, we are launch, we launch such a kind of moonshot program. Uh, yeah, it's a moonshot program, a ribbon program, set ambitious goal to attract people and promote challenges around the project with the aim of resolving difficult societal uh, issues while bringing together the wisdom of research from all over the world. That's a good thing. So, do that. So, but it was here is a kind of about 120 million US dollars for uh, five years. Yeah. Uh, Fukuda sensei, I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, your slide is stuck on the concept of self organizing production system. Oh. I think you already crossed this slide or still in the same slide. No, I'm moving to another slide. Yes, yes, because of, uh, from your speech and the slide, I found that the slide we can see is the, I mean, uh, concept of self-organizing production system. So maybe uh, if you just check, because slide is not moving in the Zoom. No, moving, not moving here. <laughs> yeah, Chinese yeah. is a moonshot program? No? No, 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 no not yet. yet. So that's Not yet? Not yet. Chutu mo it hangs. Like a kind of moonshot. This is a kind of mountain, yes. Fuji. <laughs> yes, uh, Professor Fukuda, yes, it has been stuck on this. Uh, uh, if you can see the Zoom link, it is a factory floor it has been showing. Uh, we haven't seen any other slides following that. Really? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> that's good. That's so nice. Maybe a moment. Oh, tell me that. Not, this one, not yet. Let's see. We are not seeing anything new. New? Bad. You tell me more. Once again, because again, then once again, I just make a such kind of a. I stop first. I stop the sharing the slide, okay? First. Yes, and say, yeah. So we start then the again, start from uh, the, then that page. started. Over here. Yeah, we can see. Yes, good. Now if I start from this slide, 73. Just a kind note to Professor Fukuda that I will be leaving at 12.10 and following that, 
Dr. Ahad will continue uh, this session and uh, the session ends. Is that okay, Dr. Ahad? Oh, yes, yes, yes. No problem. No problem. Okay, so I will be leaving at 12.10 and following that you will preside the session. Okay. okay. Continue Since, with Dr. Yes. Hey, Fukuda. Hey, so, yeah, Prof minute. Professor uh, Fukuda, you take as much time as you want because our next session is one o'clock. That is almost okay, one okay. hour. So you have plenty of time. Okay. Me, can you see my slide or not? Yes, yes, Sensei. Uh, Moonshot moon slide, 120 US dollar million. Yeah. We can see. Yeah, and it's uh, How about this one? Yes, perfect. This is, we choose to go to the moon with Ahad. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. Okay? Yes, Sensei. <laughs> so, Joe Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> He made such a kind of a plan in 1960. Likewise, we decided to make such a moonshot research development program uh, that kind of uh, by Japan government and uh, that uh, um, we can make a such ambitious goal to attract the people and promote challenging around the project with the aim of resolving difficult societal issues while bringing together wisdom of research for all the world. So many people can join. But anyway, this is a, so this is a moonshot program. Can you see the slide? Hey, uh, Raman-san, can you see my slide? Yes, we, we can. Yes, we can see okay, great, great. Yeah. That's great. So moonshot program here, it's a kind of AI robot. That's the kind of work, uh, 120 million years otherwise, uh, for five years. And we are having more, uh, so more, this budget will be double uh, next year. Anyway, this moonshot go, uh, I'm responsible for this one, AI, a robot. The goal is uh, this moment. Okay, goal uh, by 2050. A robot can autonomously adapt to the environment, evolve itself, intelligent, and act with a human being. Of course, that we aim 2050, that like that. So what we can do, we can think about, is that we can backcasting such a technology from 2050 to 2040, then 2040 to 2030. The 2030 to uh, uh, to the 25. That's the kind of we are doing so far. So technology, you can have like, such a goal here, but so far, like that, like that. But we just going backward from 2050 to 2040, 2030, to the 25. That's the kind of monster program here. Uh, we are not such a kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, step going up there instead go is set up in such a kind of backward okay so that's over here so we have a three type uh, type of a thing in, in mind that, that by 2050 that the air about that human do not feel uncomfortable have physical ability equivalent to the, or better than the human and grow with human life that's a kind of one. Another type two is a by to the 50. The development of automated AI robot system that aim to discover principle and solution by thinking and acting in the field of na natural science. Means a kind of a robot scientists work together with a human research scientists. They, they can propose some kind of hypothesis, work together, make a kind of experiment, those are things that can then they can reduce such a search space and look for something better. Many, many research work going on to find the kind of uh, medical drugs here or good material rather than so far. We can go into more detail by robot, AI robot. Also, 2050, develop the AI robot that autonomous judge and act in environment where it is difficult for human to act. So that's like here, so if there's a disaster by typhoon, for example, 
Now we can send the robot, okay, instead of human, because it's dangerous in such a kind of environment. Or we can send a kind of robot to the moon or some other planetary areas, planet, then we can uh, uh, explore such a here uh, for in the future, to the future, maybe you know, people live there, particularly on the moon, for example. So that's a here. So this is a kind of, uh, may, maybe I made it a kind of Fuji mountain in Japan here. Maybe the, we are aiming at next AI technology, uh, next robot technology here, and try to make such a kind of a, a fusion AI co-design, co-evolution, co-sensation, co-partner like that. So like here, physical interaction, information interaction, very important between human and the robot like that. So that's an embodiment, okay? So maybe this AI area, AI robot technology here, such as self can uh, and, uh, compromise here like that, that. Oh, also robot-wise embodiment, and also kind of sensor for tolerant material, uh, more motion-wise, tax-wise, actuation-wise, mobility-wise. That's how we try to make the next kind of technology. Everything under the, such a kind of uh, LC uh, issues. LC means ethical, legal, and societal uh, uh, social imp implication. And also standardization is very important to, to, uh, for many people in the world to share such a knowledge, okay? So once something happened here, like a spin off, spin out, that's a kind of welcome. So target one is a, uh, that's here. How we can do that? Okay, this is kind of a treatment, no, nothing or business ways. That's a kind of one robot can do that. Second one is a such a like here, image and emergence here, the field robot, a natural disaster here. So they can work here, work together, like here, okay? Many of work this, that's a group robotic technology. That's an kind of AI, that's an important to do so. Like drone checking here like that, and making something like that. So once, for example, this river here flow. River flow is a kind of a, uh, stop by the, such a kind of a disasters, then there is a road to come here, Try to have a kind of horse here. They try to remove those things, but in first of all, we use they need a kind of water pumping here to here. But this is dangerous. So robots can do autonomously you know, by many many robot. Of course, you can use such a kind of teleoperation at, at the beginning, but the eventually we try to make it uh, to such autonomous kind of be uh, development by. Uh, by 2050. So look at here. This is a robot at the volcano site, 1992, back almost 20 years ago. So maybe here, many this widespread volcano years, and maybe these are all teleoperated. We replace those teleoperated with an autonomous one. The project three, the vision, the day of scientists. Okay? So that's a good here, day here. Okay, so that's like a nice to have people work together uh, with a robot and make it. So co-evolution of human AI robot. Uh, Probably everybody can be a scientist by with this robot. Find such a nice kind of a solution. So nice finding discovery, something like that. That's good like work together. So the robot has to be many, many, many kind of literatures. Abstract. Give it such so that the human cannot do everything, okay? That's here. Also, like a kind of a, uh, 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 human can give a question, maybe the, like a special one here about this, like that, and they can make them a hypothesis together. That's important to do so. So, this is the ones here, here, robot and scientists here. And here, hypothesis here, design, action, observation, analysis, so then go back. This is cycle is very important to do so. Make a hypothesis here, design, 
Guru, 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 they are make it, okay? So they can have a kind of good work together, working human and robot with such a good, good AI. So such a, this is evolution of AI robot. For the four, is a vision society to the feet. What we are aiming at such an age society or something like that. Neither such as here. Robot will everywhere in our daily life in the year 2050. And we are also all using them natural way, okay? So our goal is to develop a robot that can, that can provide appropriate support and services depending on where they are used and on the condition of the user. Okay, this is very important. Well, some people, young people need something like that. Young one need this one. Young one or other people need this one. And young and the baby need, uh, yeah, small kid needs something like that. This is the case here, okay? Then this is something like here. We are looking at such a robot who can improve such a self efficiency. Let's help people work more with their successful experience. We help them just a little bit, not 100%. We just help 10%, 20%, something like that, try to let them stand up by themselves, okay? So I believe they can do that, then the robot will try to make a kind of something like that, try to find a, uh, such a, their, or his such an experience, successful experience, then add something like that, and then we can assist here. And then he or she thinks, maybe I can do it by myself. That a robot kind of initiation here, help with everyone do that, like that. So that's a challenge. They can do that. So this is a self-efficiency that we need a kind of good modeling, good thing, and we are looking for such a kind of uh, good kind of uh, uh, suggestion and uh, all those things from you. We work together internationally here. Okay, that's again. So that's a kind of sustainable development goal. Is uh, the SSG uh, sustainable goal. Uh, that is important by United Nations, separated to the 15. So look at the, uh, such a one to 17 goals, it's the DGs here, 17s, and seven or eight item here is relating to AI robot. That's here, that's all I put here. So that's very important. So you and Bangladeshi people here, or other people here from the world, Japan wise, or can European people there, American people there, Asian people work together. Don't leave anybody behind. That's important to listen. That's a good, robot can do that. And we are aiming to the 50. That's when nobody left there. So, okay, that's the kind of thing here. And we are aiming those things. And we are welcoming your kind of vices here. Okay? That's good. So, <clears throat> as I said, kind of uh, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, our kind of uh, big, 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 big kind of. Uh, a uh, respective uh, person made such a good comment. No great discovery was ever made with a bold guess. Also, he mentioned to the letter to the kind of Robert Fuchs here, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the so uh, shoulder of the giants. That's our ancestor, our kind of senior people, did a good job. We are based on their contribution. They what they are done. We are can advance furthermore a little bit. 
but still it's like important to think about it. And that's the kind of thing. And uh, sorry, at the beginning, I did notice that like I have a kind of a problem, slight problem. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have some Rama some Punida. Oh, my side is, didn't work well. But anyway, what I want to say is such a kind of things, based on some many, many things here, uh, today I was so happy to show such a kind of a, a, a good kind of big project for the next five years. So totaling about, uh, say, almost US dollar wise, next year, we're adding more extra US dollar wise, uh, 250 US dollar, 250 million US dollar, okay? That's again for five years. So that's a kind of, a kind of things. And we are looking for many, many suggestions from or advices from you. And you know, going to start more and more. And some of you, if you're interested in, come over to Japan. We can welcome you, all the people, to do so, like AI and the robot. That's a that's it. Uh, summary ones. Innovation challenge. I mentioned about four, five point five, four point zero, five point zero, six point zero. About four point zero. That's like a regular robot today. About five point zero is a right kind of to the fifty or to, to the thirty. That's a kind of robot. And robot of six, robot six point zero. That's a kind of thing. The year of to the forty-five. As I mentioned, to the five is a kind of pop, well, it was proposed by Kuban that machine intelligence will exceed the human intelligence, he said. But I don't think so. We can work more about that. The human is very, very smart enough to do so. And that's important. Also, aware robot, awareness of, it's important. That's a robot with awareness AI. That's important to do so. Uh, uh, that's a kind of a uh, sympathy type of can see. Not only kind of a, uh, sympathy, but we need to kind of we have to think about other people. Empathy instead of sympathy. Okay, that's important to do. So. Also, human centered robot system with AI and uh, integration of human activity and the loop and the safety and intelligence. As I said, important to do so. And ethical design, autonomous is very important. Okay. Uh, that also technical development and the public acceptance. We always face on such a kind of a, our a kind of a robot system, which is was not accepted by public so far. But we need a kind of such a kind of a, uh, kind of public acceptance for the beginning. And this must be transformative research because we saw that the moonshot problem. Moonshot is not a regular type of thing, we said that, but we need a kind of good transformative and type of nonlinear type of kind of jump of research development. And also, sustainable development is important. So that is, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, today, I just give us some talk, even though some of them happen, kind of a uh, problem, but uh, I could talk about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Fukuda Sensei. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure for us to listen uh, from a giant like you. As you mentioned in the slide uh, that uh, Newton said, that uh, shoulders of giants, and actually you are one of the giants. Uh, no, 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 And uh, I mean, for the audience, we don't, I mean, uh, you may know that, I mean, he is not only a legendary academic researcher and leader, uh, I mean, at the same time, he has more than 100 PhD students. He got, I mean, gave more than 100 PhD students an amazing work so far. And he's a wonderful 
and very humble person. Uh, I am very, very proud of, uh, of I mean, uh, that uh, he's here with us today. So now uh, the floor is open for uh, questions and answers. So if we have any questions, so please feel free uh, to raise your hand and ask. Otherwise you can type on the chat box. And I request that those who are in uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube live, uh, please uh, just uh, share the questions in the chat box. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> Professor if, Ahat, I have a question. Okay, yes, great. Okay. Uh, in your uh, conclusion uh, slide, you yes. mentioned about the singularity. Oh, the singularity, achieving, yes. Uh, achieving the singularity <clears throat> by 2045. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so are you aware about the convergent? Do you see uh, the relationship between, number one question, relationship between convergent and the singularity. And what is your basis that we will achieve singularity by the year 2045? Oh, so I knew this. Uh, the AI people, like Krugman, they are talking about such an AI. The AI people think, well, they think the AI is very good. That's why they propose, they, they, they said their AI will exceed the intelligence of human being as a, in the year of 2045, he, they said. But uh, we, like uh, Lonnie Brooks and I, we're a little bit doubted because human is a very, very intelligent, okay? That, uh, it is just, you know, kind of about 25 years, huh? Do you believe they, they said that machine intelligence will exceed human intelligence? I'm not sure. That's what I'm saying, okay? Maybe people think people can say that. However, there is no such a kind of, a, 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 such a kind of reasonable uh, thing. You human being is very, very so smart so that they can prepare those things. They study more higher than the before. So that's a kind of my, my kind of interpretation. Uh, even they said to the 45 singularity. No, no, no. That's, a, that's why uh, machine intelligence will be uh, much more than beyond the human intelligence. They said, but uh, maybe some part, but not all the things. Yes. Well, thank, uh, you, thank you very much. Uh, any other yeah. questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, let's wait for uh, from others to ask. So I have sure. a uh, this is about the uh, evolution of AI robot, the adaptable yes. AI robot, that part in one of the uh, slides. So my yes. point is that to say, like emotional or psychological issues in robotics mm -hmm. are still beyond the, I mean, human perception, like a human beings' ability and the uh, robots' emotional or psychological development to deal mm -hmm. with human. Uh, the progress is not so much. Uh, how do you think about that? Because if we say that uh, robots will overcome, I mean, take a huge lead in the next 20, 30 years, then emotional and psychological issues and the empathy and of course, legal and ethical issues are also important for a robot or group of robots to understand. So these are very much challenging, yeah. uh, but any comment on that please, thank you. Yes, uh, in my slide, I mentioned by such a kind of asymmetricity, asymmetry between human and robot. If I say it's a symmetry, between human and robot uh, capability. It means robot and human is almost the same kind of level, okay? They can do that. Unfortunately, today, such a kind of uh, robot human is not uh, such an equal in the capability. The kind of recognizing such a kind of a feeling. In this case, human is better than human and robot, but the robot can remember. Also, what happened so far? La 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 la. 
So this is not a symmetric, okay, in the behavior wise, can functional wise. So that's the second thing here. So the feeling wise, for example, what you mentioned, okay, you question. That's like a robot uh, uh, today cannot understand such a kind of human uh, feeling so well. But the thing the human can understand what other people do that. So that we try to have a more kind of intelligent way such a robot can understand and to such a human behavior, but also human feeling and try to have a more kind of empathy. That's the thing. That's again, so the robot, you know, that's a kind of thing, okay? It is not symmetric. So that's why the robot, human can understand what the robot doing. Robot cannot understand, but the robot can do more than like that. Of course, we robot can show such a kind of expression of kind of sad or happy or surprise or something. But that is not enough. We need a more generic, more we are more such a kind of uh, thing of uh, feeling. That's a kind of AI. So that uh, we try to develop such a kind of uh, uh, engine for uh, or AI or for kind of uh, feeling. Yes, that's a kind of very important. And uh, this is a kind, of, you know, kind of we have to work together with. Uh, uh, psychological uh, scientists. And one of them, that, that's, as I mentioned, is kind of self-efficacy. That's the thing. So we don't support the people. 100% boom. No, no, we just give up 10%, 20% more. The, we don't do much, too much, okay? This is a, such an intelligent way to do so. Uh, understanding such a feeling of those things, okay? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, if you allow me, uh, 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 Professor Fukuda, is sure. it okay to ask a few more questions if you have time? Sure. Why not? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. And another point is that, I mean, just today, uh, Matthew Dark uh, had a presentation. He discussed about the fairness and bias, racial bias, yes. and other kinds of bias. Yes. These kind of biasing issues. Now, uh, if a project is solely done in Japan or in China or Korea where diversity or multiculturalism less. So those concepts are robots uh, and their, uh, uh, I mean, AI part will be basically for that kind of people and for that region mostly. Am I right? Yes. It will not be universal. Okay. And it's very difficult to make it generalized. Yes. Uh, I mean, AI. That's a problem. Korea. That today, this is a very, very, we are very concerned about those things. That's a kind of a uh, vulnerability of AI. Uh, how we can avoid such a kind of a bias one here? A human is educated from the beginning, okay? It took a of 80 years or 10 years or 20 years to get a degree, first degree, okay? Be, uh, after the education, uh, robot wise, oh, they are not easy for them to teach, educate. How we can do that? Generically, they are such a kind of a, uh, uh, humane, okay? That's a very important to do so. So we need such a mechanism to have a kind of a uh, to avoid such a biased behavior. Okay. So we need such a, we, 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 like we are educated in a way, we are what's a fair, what's a kind of unbiased here like that, but the uh, robot, in this case, what do we can do that? This is another issue to, to have those things. So that's why we are talking about LC problem, LC, ethical, legal, uh, social implication for the beginning. So that's a kind of working together. That's important to do to think so. Uh, particularly what you say, the diversity inclusion is very good, but they also have such a kind of thing. But anyway, such a kind of bias one, kind of fairness. That's a kind of a very important you mentioned in, from the people under LC. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? I, I didn't find any raised hands. So I think that uh, we, we have uh, taken uh, plenty of your time and uh, we are really grateful to have you. And uh, hopefully by the end of this year, I'll, uh, I will try to meet you again. <laughs> uh, ah. Yeah. My good friend, uh, we should get together. Yeah, yeah. And then we discuss uh, some of the issues uh, regarding uh, this uh, project and whether uh, I can be part of it uh, with some others uh, globally and especially with some uh, great researchers from Bangladesh and yes. our, our students. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Fukuda, uh, for your. Thank you very much for your invitation. Yeah. And hope to see you in Bangladesh in the future and, of course, uh, uh, in person. Sure. Yeah. See you. Sayonara. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, dear Ahad Sensei, uh, ah. if you allow, we can take a virtual group photo. Oh, okay, okay. Please, uh, without please take a speaker. So I would like to once again... Say, we'll take a photo together, so... Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can, can, can you see my face? Yes, yes. Okay. So... Uh, I would like to request uh, Fukuda Sensei to stop the presentation, please. Okay, so the moment. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Hi. Okay, so uh, I'm taking the goof out now. Yes. So one, two, two. two. Three. Three. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Thank you. Hi, how are you? Oh, are you okay? Are you okay? I hope you will be get uh, recover yourself soon, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. You should recover yourself quickly. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, Sensei. Yeah. Uh, see you again. Thank you so much. And bye -bye. Thank, you, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm very honored to be invited by you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, we'd like to close this uh, keynote session and then we'll start our, our next session uh, where uh, um, uh, it, will be, it will start from Bangladesh time 1 p.m., which is just uh, uh, 35 34 minutes from now on. Uh, the next speaker is uh, another uh, great Japanese, Takaki Kajita, Nobel laureate in physics uh, to 2015. So uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, attend and enjoy uh, the, another great mind talk soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.